Welcome to the Austin Public Library podcast and our second season of Reading for Life. My name is Julie Kleinfelter, Director of the Public Library in Austin, Minnesota, and I'm here today with friends to talk about the book, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. The purpose of Reading for Life is to grow community around a shared love of literature. Real community begins and ends with our imaginations, and few resources are as vital to the imagination's development as works of literature. The combination of those things foster conversation. With me today is my co-host, Michael Verde. Michael graduated with honors from the University of Texas's Plan to Honors program, earned an MA in Literary Studies from the University of Iowa, and an MA in Theology from the University of Durham, England. He's taught for 15 years at the university and college prep school levels, most recently at Indiana University, as in currently completing his PhD with a focus on literature and religion. Michael founded Reading for Life in 2005. Also joining us is Steve Harson the Public Library Consultant for Southeastern Libraries Cooperating, past director at the Grand Marais Public Library in Grand Marais, Minnesota, and a past president of the Minnesota Library Association. He's been a regular contributor for our Reading for Life program. And then last but not least, we're very honored to have author Tim O'Brien with us today. Tim is, American, Tim is an American novelist whose writings on the Vietnam War and post-war lives of its veterans have resonated with many. Among other accolades, The Things They Carried was added to the Library of Congress's list of 65 most influential books in U.S. history. And to top it off, Tim is from right here, was born right here in Austin, Minnesota. So we have met once before. We actually did this a little out of order this time, and we've had our discussion, our lecture. And so we're getting back together to do this podcast, and I'm really excited that all three of us, all four of us are here today to carry on this really great conversation that we started um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Julie, do you use those verbs like carry on on purpose? I mean, it's, it's really smooth the way you do that and so self-effacing too, that's really special. So how about for fun, since this is our second conversation and I threw out the idea that we would talk, you know, not exclusively, but perhaps largely about the first and last chapters and, and I'm wondering maybe if Julie and Steve, if you did take a look at those chapters again after our last conversation, I would be interested truly in something or several things that you noticed in this reading of those first and last chapters that you had not noticed before our previous conversation. I always find that interesting. So maybe just that's a fun place to start. I had a lot of things going on in my head when I went back and read through the first chapter. One of the things that I kind of made notes on, which I noticed the first time around, but I wasn't sure what it really brought up was when at right off, we're talking about Ted Lavender. When, whenever in that first chapter, Ted Lavender gets talked about, it's the, you know, the first time it was, you know, Tim Lavender, Ted Lavender, sorry, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside of the village. That was one. The second time was until he was shot, Ted Lavender. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender was shot. It, it, and it came up six or seven, I think I counted seven times in that one chapter. Which again, one of the things I've learned from Michael is when you start seeing things repeated, you know, there's probably something important there. So that was that was kind of what actually came up the most for me in that first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I, uh, I really love how repetition works mm -hmm. in this novel. I haven't read uh, other novels by Tim, so I I'm, I'm, can't speak for that. But the, the way repetition is used in this novel is so satisfying. I mean, it's just satisfying rhythmically, uh, number one, and the way that it, it does call your attention to the language not but in a you know inconspicuous sort of way and without feeling forced so anyway I think that I just want to recognize that repetition really is one of the ways one of the ways that words can connect with each other in a non-arbitrary way so let me just say sort of what I mean by that when we typically use words they're signs for something that are not words they have they're signifiers that point to signifieds, and what makes them real is the signified. So if you got C-A-T, those three letters, what makes those three letters somehow real and the word more real is there's a little creature on the couch that's purring. 
And I want to suggest that while that might be a, a, a absolutely effective and necessary way to read most uses of language, when we're working with works of art, that's not how words mean, at least principally. They don't mean by pointing to something that is nonverbal that is more real than the words. That said, when things point to something, the relationship is arbitrary and, and uh, conventional. In other words, there's no necessary relationship between the word cat and the thing on the couch. In another language, it's a different word. So it's arbitrary. But when words are used in a, in a text that means through coherence and its intra-reference through its integrity as a verbal body, then those words start to have non-arbitrary associations. In other words, it's no longer just a matter of convention. It's a matter now of the imagination. And one of the ways that words can link up with one another in a non-arbitrary way is through this repetition. In other words, it is a one way of calling the reader's imagination to, of a, attention to the medium in which meaning is being made. So I just think that that's a, an important thing in terms of reading to keep in mind. And uh, Steve, I, and, then I, and then Julie. Michael, I'd like to take what you're saying and build on that a little bit. And I want to turn this into almost like a question for um, Tim to uh, comment on to see if, if I'm on the right track here. But you're talking about repetition and that the more repetition you get, the more important it is. And that the words themselves may not be as critical, but what I admire about Tim's work is that he uses these words to create metaphors. And he's using metaphors because he's trying to help people feel what it was like to be there, to experience the emotion, the internal uh, sense of what the Vietnam War was about versus producing another history that's dry and that you can't really connect with. He wants them to feel it. And he's doing that by piling metaphor on metaphor on metaphor. And the repetition is part of the, the device that's used there, I feel. I think about, uh, what's the soldier's name, Lemon? where the story is told three different times, completely different versions of the story, but each one of them is a different way to feel that experience. And so that repetition is not really repetition, but it is repeating the same story kind of. Um, and I, I, I sense that about your work just in general, uh, Tim, is that you're, you're really working hard for people to feel what it was like to be in Vietnam. Yeah, I mean, repetition is really important to me. It always has been in all my work, not just in the things they carried. Uh, all of us do repetitions in our memories all the time. Your father throwing a baseball to you when you're six years old, and then when you're in high school, and then imagining him throwing it when he's lying in his coffin, even though he's not even alive anymore. Uh, second, repetition is an old and honorable uh, literary technique. Uh, the repetition, for example, of refrains to songs and in poems, they're a device that help us remember through repetition. And this goes kind of what Steve was just asking about, that yes, I do want my readers to feel not just the feelings of war, but of homesickness and of love and of loss and of hopelessness and of joy, that gamut of human emotions. And repetition is a way of, uh, for a writer to, to, to move toward that. Uh, for example, in that first chapter, I repeat the word carry in all kinds of ways. That was almost a technical challenge for myself to carry physical things, the ordinary meaning, we, but also to carry intangibles, the weight of memory, not, not a tangible, but we talk about it. Uh, the, <laughs> the phrase that Michael just talked about and Julie mentioned, carry on, it was used all the time in Vietnam. It was used in the sense of keep going, don't stop. 
uh, to carry yourself with poise and to carry yourself with dignity, another meaning. Um, the Jimmy Cross carrying not only the cross of his name, but carrying the responsibility for Ted Lavender's death, which he carries throughout the entire book. People don't die and you forget about it. Your own mom, your dad, your brother, whoever passes away in your life. Um, so you're carrying on in all kinds of ways and you're carrying the memory with you for the rest of your life and maybe afterward. So it has a certain spiritual meaning as well, which I tried to accent in it. These are all repetitions just of a single word, trying to plumb the depths of the word carry it. As Michael said, a single word begins to matter, it begins to expand. Um, and again, this is not true only with uh, the things they carried. It's been a, not, a, a, not a literary thing for me, it's been a life thing. I've lived with these repetitions. Vietnam hasn't ended for me. Goes on at night, goes on in my daydreams, goes on as I turn on uh, my Zoom for to uh, do this podcast. I'm thinking about, uh oh, we're going back to Vietnam. And we're going back not just to Vietnam, but we're going back to the writing of Vietnam, of the things they carried, what had gone through my head. So when we, when we begin this discussion with repetition, there is so much that 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 that, uh, that word that word entails, uh, not just in a literary way, but in a very human way. Well, and I thought it was interesting that Michael asked us to read the first and the last chapter again because you you see those differently after reading the first chapter and then moving to the last. You know, there is that link then with the repetition and the 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 idea that the stories keep people alive for us and linda you know that that's something that's been going on and and the and i really like the imagery there's a lot of circles and loops and the yellow floodlights it's the yellow the yellow street light and the yellow floodlights and the and the loops and the circles and then you know bringing it all kind of together in that in the last line of realizing that it is as Tim trying to save Timmy's life with a story, you know, and it's that it just reading those two chapters together was really kind of amazing. So I was just thinking, and first of all, it's, it's so much fun to listen to people's imaginations like this, you know, I just ordinarily don't have conversations like this. It's not easy, even with a, a loved one that you're intimate with, you may not be. So I just want to say there's a, a kind of pleasure in knowing people through our imaginations, which is a fairly atypical way, mm -hmm. but a very interesting kind of intimate way to know someone too. So I just want to, to point out the pleasure of just being in this kind of conversational space. And Tim mentioned repetition as it relates to songs and what I think is so wonderful about that idea, and it works that way in this novel in many ways. You know, initially the novel was so novel in its form that whoever sets themselves up as arbit arbiters of what constitutes a genre, I, I noticed early on a lot of scuttlebutt about is this a novel or not a novel? Clearly, no one who asked that question has read uh, Ulysses or very many novels to know that there isn't a uh, form of the novel that is somehow the acid test. But in any case, uh, the, the analogy here is what makes a song a unity? And what makes a song a unity it very likely involves the lyrics, but more primarily, there is a rhythm there. Uh, and, and there is a refrain that one comes back to that's very simple so that the unity of the song, in a sense, is uh, consolidating around maybe a very pithy phrase, but it has a movement to it that is the source of its unity. So I'm suggesting that what unifies something can be as much to do with these associations and reverberations as it has to do with a plot line and might be even more, more so. Another wonderful way of thinking about music and with regards to a novel and this novel in particular is that we, we understand that our body is involved in the meaning of music. In other words, if someone has a, a relationship to music from the neck up, we know that they really don't understand music. 
you can't understand music cerebrally. If you try, you will, you may get everything and miss everything at the same time. So that's another, I think, way to think, what is it about a, a work of fiction that also requires more than my neck up to participate meaningfully in it? And then um, I think that helps wean us from Mitchell Sanders addiction of what is the moral here or of trying to analyze something and again in an intellectual way that is going to we're going to appropriate it for our intellect there's something kind of aggressive about that and every and when you do that a story is going to get away from you the same way that a song or music is going to get away with you so get away from you so i think that's also a helpful analogy another thing regarding rhythm and repetition and julie you mentioned circles and you also mentioned loops and spirals and I think there's an important distinction between the two. This novel is very much in interested in spins, very much interested in turns, also circles. But when a circle starts to turn, then it's becoming a spiral. And a circle that's a spiral has repetition, but it doesn't have monotony. It, it has repetition that takes on another dimension. It's repetition in the service of movement. <laughs> Uh, a circle without any kind of vertical axis, which is, I'm guessing, pretty close to the definition of nature, is not going anywhere uh, because there isn't that turn in it. And that turn, I'm going to propose, is what the imagination contributes to nature. So no, nature left on its own that goes around and around endlessly. I'm using these this imagery because the novel does. The novel talks about repetitiveness that isn't going anywhere versus turns and spins. So you can imagine, in other words, repetition in the service of a vertical ascent. I'm suggesting that another way of saying this is that music time is the opposite of clock time. That music takes clock time and turns it into music time. And in a sense, it transfigures or transforms a circle into something that is no longer repetitive in a monotonous or dead way, but repetitive in a way that builds up momentum, that can generate something out of itself that's larger than itself. So, and these are things I'm suggesting because they're all implicit in the novel. Steve, I see you. And in the sense that you're talking about this being almost a musical quality and whatnot, what I see here is to me, this feels like oral storytelling that's so massive that it had to be written down. And it feels to me like this is a bunch of stories that might be shared serially through a lifetime, say Tim with your children, your friends, your acquaintances, that these are a bunch of stories that you would tell stories of as a storytelling kind of an activity, oral, uh, oral sharing of the story. And that because it's just so massive, you had to gather them together into a writing in order to make sense. And like music, oral storytelling has a kind of a rhythm and it has repetitiveness and it has that beginning and an end and it comes in a circle like your first and last chapters. And to me, it feels a lot like that kind of an experience as I read it. Yeah, so I think that's true also of life itself. Mm -hmm. that I think all of us know this circularity, a, a kind of returning to what one once was, a little boy in a little town in southern Minnesota playing war out on the golf course with relics of his father's war, the old World War II helmet liners and canteens you could buy down at the Army Surplus Store on 10th Avenue in Worthington. And then returning to that time near the end of the book, or at the end of the book, uh, re recounting my first encounter with death. It does change. It does accelerate. When you're young, the dead look alive, or they look really, really dead, one of the two. They don't look almost dead. But in Vietnam, people looked almost dead all the time. I remember looking at my friends, thinking, what would that guy look like if directly five feet ahead of me, if he stepped on a landmine? What kind of gurgling sounds would I be hearing as he, his legs vanished? Um, the, uh, 
The story of Linda at the end of the book, I'll contribute this little tidbit of autobiography, is it's based on a real human being. Uh, a girl whose real name was Lorna Lou Moeller. I changed her name, as I said at the end of the book. But she, often I don't have models for my characters. I borrow names, but I very rarely use models. I'll borrow a, a facial characteristic from the real world or a habit of movement. But in this case, it was a real little girl who uh, contracted a brain tumor when I was in fourth grade. And uh, she had gone away to the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I didn't know she had a brain tumor. Nobody, none of us kids knew. And she came back after exploratory surgery wearing this kind of red elf, elf's hat or stocking cap with a long uh, flap coming down, a little white tassel hanging from it. Uh, I was madly in love with her as much as you can be as a fourth grader, which is a lot. We denigrate that kind of love as puppy love and kind of smile or chuckle at it, thinking it's less important, less intense less real even than adult love. This was love, love. And it was returned, I'm pretty sure. In fact, more than pretty. I'm, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure, more than pretty sure. And uh, we're, we're nine-year-old kids. Uh, that summer after uh, fourth grade, I, I did the bravest thing of my life until then. I went to her house and visited her. She was waiting, her mom told, my mom told her mom I was coming. I'd cut some flowers in the garden and brought them over to her. And she was sitting waiting for me on the front steps of her house about five blocks away. And I walked up, neither, neither of us said a single fucking word, <laughs> nothing. She smiled and I smiled even to her. Uh, and that, that was it, I left. She didn't say thank you, um, but we knew from the, the looking at each other what was going on with that. Uh, she died when early in uh, the next following fall uh, in September. There was a kid named, uh, not Nick Veenhoff, his real name I won't say because maybe he has <laughs> relatives living in Worthington. But he, was, he was the model for uh, the Nick Veenhoff character. Who, who did walk her home after making fun of her in the class that day. Hmm. So it's an encounter as a kid with a loved one dead that was prefatory in the real world to the deaths of all these other people who died uh, in the course of not only Vietnam, but of my life, my first encounter with it. Uh, so you, you sort of see the circularity, but at the same time, I think Michael's absolutely right about the spiral. Intensities change. One's attitude toward death changes. That's one of the reasons for the repetition of things, going back to this concept of repetition. When you look at something from a different angle of vision, you see it and remember it differently. If you look at a thing happening from say 40 yards away, and then you come up close to it, there's a different feel to it and you see differently. You see things in close up, not in zoom, you know, from a distance. Uh, and I wanted to get that feeling with the death of uh, Kurt Lemon as he, uh, the three or four times I recount that, uh, culminating with, you know, that line, it was the sunlight that was killing him. Hence, in a way, I, his name is that yellow sun color, lavender's color, as Steve said. It's, there's some metaphor. The color of blood, when it begins to coagulate after maybe three or four minutes, it gets purplish. It's no longer that bright red. It gets purplish. Hence that name, Cross's name. So there's, there is metaphorical and or symbolic meaning to the choices of these, of these names and of every single word in the book. For that matter, I'm a slow, painstaking uh, writer and a slow, painstaking reviser, going over and over things, trying to highlight uh, the things in the book that I want to last outside of the plot. I want to leave uh, a fabric of, of language that will have an effect on the reader, almost as Michael said, a bodily effect. Um, there is not a lot of plot 
in the things they carry, really a plot line that it's not there. It's uh, it's more a, 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 an immersion in language, hyphen, uh, I don't want to say death exactly, maybe life is even a better word, but life on the edge of death. Why? Because we all will endure it. We're all going to have our Vietnams, our wars. We're all facing the grave or the crematorium or having your wife just dump you in a lake or whatever she's going to do with you at the end of things. But well, I think that's the, that's what I think that's what makes your book so powerful, Tim. This is not this is not a history of the Vietnam War. This is not a documentary. This is a telling of something that gives you the feeling of the experience of being in Vietnam. And that's a whole different kind of a work. And I think that that's why people reacted to this so strongly was you connected with them and they could feel it. They, they, they understood what your experience was there. And that's really powerful. And it takes all kinds of literary talent to be able to pull that off. It takes more than talent. It does take talent, you're right. That words come to me, but it takes a laborious, ferocious... Joseph Conrad had this line uh, in one of his letters. He said, the sitting down is all. And it really is. I have so many friends and acquaintances who say, I've got a great story, I've got a novel. But you have to sit down for hours and hours on end repetitively. Flaubert uh, wrote in his letter, letters about this, about, he didn't call it the sitting down process, but how the, revisit, the revisiting of a story, not just in the composition of the story, but in the revision of the story and the, and the, the doing away with the extraneous thing, this deletion, but there's a lot of it. There's the recombinant part where you're bringing threads in closer proximity so the audience or the reader will recognize there are all kinds of things that go on. You do have to have a certain gift of gab. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a low-grade way of, of, of saying a, 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 the ability to use language where, where you don't struggle for the language, you struggle for almost sometimes doing away with the language. You know, things that, it's like with a, you have a great ring with a beautiful stone in it, but it's surrounded by this god awful setting. And so you don't notice the emerald, you notice this brass ugly setting with, you know, death heads on it and stuff. And a lot of that, that, that dispensing with the extraneous is really, really important, and it takes time. Um, I've just finished, I don't know which, the 50th revision of a new novel, and I'm going to be revising it again. It came with uh, to me in what are called galley proofs a couple, what, four or five days ago. I went through them, found things I didn't like. I, I found extraneous stuff that I deleted. And, I'm, and I asked for one more pass. It'll probably cost me money you know, to do this extra one. But I want, but I, I care about the reader not having to uh, read, not having to struggle except for the things that a reader should be struggling for. Um, uh, what, the sort of things Michael's talking about, paying attention to language, pay attention to it. That's what the reader should be doing. But the reader should not be, be uh, besieged with uh extraneous decorative stuff many many writers decorate their prose these days especially and the the, the result for me is boredom mixed with a bit of anger like, why all the decoration and i don't i don't care for it ulysses is a long long book but it's not decorated. <laughs> it's, every word in that book is essential, including the trillion words I had to look up as I read it the first time. I mean, I looked up a boatload in my junior year in college. And so, yeah, th those are some of the things. Talent matters. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, the gift of language matters. But like anything worth doing, I feel I feel that a good writer spends the time to do favors for his reader. And to me, I feel like you're describing what's the difference between oral storytelling, where often you embellish it and add to it as you repeat it and as you tell it, versus when you're writing and you're you're condensing it and you're cutting out the extraneous stuff. And how challenging must that have been for you to take what feels like oral storytelling stories and to turn it into written words. I can imagine that you must have, you must have edited and re-edited and edited your edits. Yeah, your you writer said, has practiced times. writing through conversations. A word, a word or a phrase might come out of your mouth in conversation and a writer, if it has a certain potency, you hear it as you're saying it, you get to recall it and use it turn it into a phrase and then maybe into a clause and then maybe into a whole sentence. So, but there's a listening in life thing that goes on. And what I'm trying to do here is to try to combine lived life with writing. They aren't two separate things. They're part of one another. My life is fed. That's why I told you the anecdote of the real Linda, uh, Lorna Lou. Her mother, by the way, read that story Years and years, she left Worthington, had gone out to Arizona, I think Phoenix, possibly Tucson, one of the big cities, and she was in a dentist's office. She was my age now, probably in her late 70s, and uh, her daughter had been dead for, what, 30, 40 years, a long, long time, and she sat down in the... Uh, waiting room and in the waiting room was a cop copy of Esquire magazine where that chapter first appeared and she recognized my name on the cover and knew I re remembered me picked it up started reading and there is her daughter her husband was no longer alive her other kid was no longer alive and she thought because she wrote me a long, long letter about this. She thought she was the only person on earth who remembered this little girl. Only person. So she, she didn't get her teeth drilled that day, obviously. She left and went home and wrote me this letter that was written on computer paper, the old kind with the perforated edges. Went on for like, you could, roll it across the living room, um, cussing out the Nick Wienhoff guy, the real guy, what an asshole he was, and <laughs> applauding me for bringing the flowers to a little girl, but mostly saying how a little girl who had been dead to the world, so she thought and would be once she was dead, was going to be living in the pages of this book, not the embodied physical little girl but something what a gift wow. wow that's that's beautiful absolutely beautiful it's not i mean I, I didn't mean to tear up i do it every time i talk about this because the subject matter is tearful i'd be yeah. crazy not to yeah but um the other side of the coin to that story is i did not write that story for that mother I didn't know she was any, I wrote it for the world and for myself and uh, did it, for, I slaved over it to the things I talked about earlier to make it a decent piece of art. Uh, we're sort of straying from what we were, Michael and I were going to talk about today and Steve and Julie, but uh, it's a kind of a good strain, the way it happens in a novel, where you move kind of away from the theme, but we are talking about the end of the book. That's the great thing about this podcast, Tim, that we found is we stray all over the place. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and what's nice is we have time to do that and to come back and do a second podcast and stray all over the place again, too. No, that's that's an amazing story. And, and I mean, at the end of the day, that's part of what we read stories for, right? It's to 
the it's it's kind of that the only way we will ever be immortal is through those stories that anyone will ever be immortal and what a gift you know like you said you didn't write that for that mother but what a gift for her to know that that linda lives on in that way in in for so many people um, the, odd, the odd thing and also julie is that the mother's letter to me said kind of what i was saying when linda was speaking she said he, he says what's it like to be dead and she said it's like being inside a book i loved that line. No one's reading yeah. and then somebody picks you up and there goes huck finn down the path down to the mississippi to board his raft but we don't but for a while huck is dead in our heads but then you somebody mentions huckleberry finn or you reread it and there it is again there, there's something magical about it a kind of uh I, I don't mean this as religiosity, but there's a kind of rebirth, mm -hmm. uh, kind of salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's kind of, it's not literally, I'm returning to earth as a physical human being, but the Bible doesn't say that either, does it? Mm -hmm. um, that, except in a couple of cases, and even then, I'm not sure it's meant physically. I kind of doubt it is, but that's interpretive. And well, that being dead in, is like being in a book is also then applies to so many of the other characters in your work. They're, they're dead. I think every writer feels that way, Steve. I think all of us do. That For us, our characters are at least as real as the people around us. And in a lot of ways more so because I'm living inside these characters for years and years. <laughs> I'm not seeing them now and then on the street or, you know, at the dinner table. They're with me all the time. Uh, and they stay with me for all the time. They're as real as you and Julie and Michael in their own way. But when you're not present with me, they're as real as you are exactly and maybe more so because you're not physically with me nor are they physically with me so jimmy i can see and eat the tim character and linda and, and lavender and azar they 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 are for me uh creatures as michael put it of the imagination the imagination intersects with language and makes something of it spirits in the head i call it Mm, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So for fun, I want to take the two principal characteristics or aspects that Tim mentioned that can culminate into a work of art, a gift, and then the labor. And not just labor, as Tim described it, it's a, a sacrificial labor. And there's a, an important distinction I mean, why is James Joyce, for instance, at the end of his life, 16 hours in an attic and looking almost translucently pale when the real world is apparently going on hmm. around him? Well, I'm guessing because he doesn't imagine that the real world is necessarily going on around him. <laughs> There's something that's at stake in what he's doing in that attic that might be salvific for the world that's going on around him. And I use circle now in the sense of just a natural repetition that goes nowhere. But in any case, I want to take those two qualities because it's a great way to think about the first and the last and the first chapter. Tim has the gift. In this last chapter, Tim's imagination calls him. The, the response to Linda's death, the imagination comes out in what is like a dream, but not a dream, this daydreaming that starts to take over Tim's life. In some sense, that's the calling. That's the imagination now that has looked at death and objected to his mother's claim that it is inevitable that everyone will die because Tim's response, not Linda. And that rejection right there is something in Tim that is absolutely crucial to Tim becoming an artist and everything that follows thereafter. And I, I mentioned the circles initially and how that relates to nature because of this reason. There's something in the artist that says th that is not the end of the story. It's not saying that that's unreal. 
it's saying that nature doesn't get the last word here, not as an anti-nature, but as a, a participant in nature that elevates it or does something to it in which the circle doesn't get the last word. In any case, you can see when, when Tim moves tenaciously towards these dreams and bringing Linda alive in his dreams, that's a calling now. That's the awareness that Tim now is a host of something that is larger than Tim. So I wanted to say that's one of the two qualities that Tim O'Brien mentioned. The other, the laborious, the sacrificial labor. I think that can br brings us back to the first chapter or to the first chapter in a very important way because there is a point in the first chapter when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross realizes that his relationship to fantasy is not going to, it's, it's going to lead to death. It's not going to, it's not even going to not save life. It's going to cost life. And it's certainly not going to enable the kind of resurrection that Tim is talking about. In other words, there, Jimmy Cross is going to have to let that relationship to illusion go. This novel plays with different relationships to illusion. There's an illusion that's an evasion of death. And then there is an illusion that is the transfiguration of death. And those two illusions, in some sense, are the critical difference between every character in this novel. Lieutenant Jimmy Cross starts out with a relationship to ascension that is pretense. And this is, this is symbol, symbolized in a lot of ways, but Martha being from Mount Sebastian and his fantasies of being in the White Mountains and romance. That is, an, uh, that is an, a relationship to dreaming that is not what Tim is having in the last chapter. The Tim's dreaming of Linda is not Jimmy Cross's dreaming of Martha. And at some point, and it's, it's at some point, Jimmy Cross's relationship to that fantasy world is a conscious rejection that this is not the path. And what the path turns out to be, is this real? Now, Jimmy Cross doesn't necessarily make that path, but he at least comes to the realization that this artificial ascension is not, is, that's not going to defeat death. That's actually going to lead to death. The laborious sacrifice begins after the realization that this false ascent isn't going to get us there. And if it's not going to get us there, then what will get us here? And then this is where the repetition of sacrificial labor comes in. And there is an incredible, mo beautiful moment in the first chapter. And there's a little bit of playfulness here with language. When Lee Strunk is, uh, Strunk and White have a book called Elements of Style. <laughs> and it's all about- That's why I chose it. <laughs> there you go. And, 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 and there are five elements to the element of style. And you start to see that the way Jimmy Cross decides he's going to lead these men are eerily, beautifully analogous to the kind of advice you would get from right elements of style, okay? Everything that Tim had been mentioning about editing, those are the kinds of things that at the end of the first chapter, Jimmy Cross starts to commit himself to with regards to the leadership of these men. Now, if we take the first sentence that he's carrying letters and playfully imagine that as A, B, C's, and D's, and then we think of the other element of this first chapter, which has to do with the men, and we just playfully bring those two in metaphorical relation, which is one is the other. Love is a rose. It's not like a rose. Love is a rose. But it's also not a rose because it's obviously a rose is a plant. But nevertheless, so in other words, a metaphor is and is not, but it is not like. It's not like, that's a simile. In any case, if we take that these letters and we take these men and we metaphorically identify them, then we can playfully, which is to say our imagination can say that Jimmy Cross's relationship to those men is metaphorically his relationship to letters. And then you can begin to see that organizing those men, putting them into a form, the word here is together, it's, this is Tim words, of getting your shit together is one way of saying getting your matter, your matter that is going around in a circle. If you're going to have that resurrect, if you're going to have it elevate, then it's going to have to get into a form that nature doesn't offer. 
You're going to have to bring these men into a kind of unity in which every man is part of one man. I'm suggesting then that Jimmy Cross is the, the beginning of the second quality that Tim mentions. And if you were to imagine this novel as a buildings roman or as a novel, education novel, it, it really is the education of becoming a writer, the education of writing a true war story. But beautifully, it is also an education in being a reader. There's a simultaneous uh, kind of education taking place, but not through moralizing or generalization, through a kind of experience. And so I want to suggest that one relationship between the first and last chapter is that what Timmy gets called to do in some way is the beginning because now what, excuse me, what Tim is called to do is in some way the beginning because now what Tim has to do is the second part of those two qualities. He has to take up the cross of learning to write, which is going to cost him his life in many ways. There's going to be aspects of his life that aren't going to be realized like the other men's lives. There are things that they're going to do that he's going to be disconnected from, as Donald, Bar Donald Bartlemy says, he's not going to have the fun in the fun house. So he's going to have to be the builder of fun houses. So this, this writer, in some ways, is never going to be directly with his men in that kind of, uh, of oblivion that is finding escape in the superficial things, including small talk, including the flippant kind of talk. But that's, that's part of the sacrifice. But then part of the sacrifice has to do with learning the medium in an intimate way. And then you can see in the first chapter that Jimmy Cross is arriving at least at the realization of the first step that this artificial ascent isn't going to do it. And I've got to get my shit together. And if that shit all of a sudden is metaphorical for both a material body and also for verbal bodies, then you start to read the novel in a whole nother frame of consequence. I'm going to add, Michael, that in the last chapter, there's a passage that really summarizes all this stuff. Um, and it's inside the body or beyond the body, there's something absolute and unchanging. The human life is all one thing, like a blade tracing loops on ice. As a writer, now I want to save Linda's life, not her body, her life. And then skipping ahead a little more. Uh, in a story, I can steal her soul. I can revive at least briefly that which is absolute and unchanging. And th to me, that's like a nice summary of what the whole book does for a whole cast of characters. Well, that was my intent, uh, or one of my main intents, that to bring alive that which happened 30 years ago and is now dead, history gone, uh, to revivify uh, an era, a time, a war, a group of men, human beings, and all the emotions that accompanied that, uh, everything from great joy to have survived a firefight. There's a line in the book about how it's a very cruel and unexpected, and certainly you don't see this in John Wayne movies, but there's a sense of relief at being alive and others are dead around you. You're full of sorrow and grief and sometimes anger, but you're also full of, thank God, it's not got my name, O'Brien, lying there that they're talking about now. Uh, the emotions are contradictory, and that's another one of the things I tried to stress in the book, that, that there's a passage in uh, How to Tell a True War Story, the chapter at the center of the book, in which... It says basically war is love, war is hatred, war is courage, war is death. All these contradictions, I list like I just got a little riff where I go on about it. It's all these things as life is. It's contradiction in all of us. You love your husband, but you fall in love with another man. What do you do? It Shakespeare writes about this hundreds of his followers who came later. Um, we, the human soul is not one thing. It's fluid and, and volatile, um, as is human experience. When I read bad novels, they're bad for a reason for me, which is that quality is not there. 
the villains are always villainous, conspicuously so, and the heroes are way too hero heroic. They're, they're like Sir Lancelot plated in platinum. <laughs> they're impossible. And therefore, they're, they're cartoonish to me. The, the contradictions that live in all of us, I try to get at in this book. Um, Jimmy does love Martha. And as Michael so eloquently just articulated, he, he goes through a, a change in the course of that story, realizing that fantasy is going to end up killing people. And there's a great line in from William Butler Yeats, the poet, we had fed the heart on fantasy, the heart's grown brutal from the fair. And I think sometimes of my own country that way, the fantasies of guns and cars and crime and the fantasies of happy ever after in a specific kind of a 1950s movie kind of way where Ozzy and Harriet are never going to have troubles in their marriage. Erasing racism, erasing McCarthyism, erasing all the problems of the 1950s. I think when Americans today speak of make America great again, well, great is some, some the sort of 40s, 50s, early 60s movies. I think that's what they're, is in their head. They're not thinking the Civil War, for God's sake. They're not th thinking of prohibition. They're not thinking of when women couldn't vote. They're thinking something about in those sort of those, those buoyant mythological years of America the triumphant after World War II, America the prosperous, America the technicolored Cecil B. DeMille slash add a whole bunch more. Um, that 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 kind of bland, homogenized look at our country is not the country I know. Ours is a country of contradictions. God knows we're living through millions of them right now. I mean, this moment with the whole debt ceiling thing going on. Um, and we should certainly live through them in January. So contradiction in character seems to me so important because it seems... Uh, I won't say at the heart of what we are as human beings, but it's 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 certainly inextricable to the human heart contradiction. Chipmunks and gerbils are consistent. Human beings aren't. <laughs> and I'd rather be a human being for all my contradictions than, than, than be a gerbil, I think. I've never been one, so I'm not gonna say 100% again. <laughs> Anything's possible. There are times when I wish I were a gerbil and the world weren't what it is. <laughs> that's that's amazing. I as, as often happens, there are so many different ways we can continue on this conversation, but I think we may be at a good place to pause and and pick this up again. Michael, do you have any closing thoughts or Steve or Tim? Any last Bits oh, I, I wanted to say before. thank you to Michael and Steve and Julie. I mean, it's been so wonderful having a sensible uh, con converse. I mean, sensible to us. I'm not sure to your audience how sensible it will be, but uh, as, a, as a writer and as a reader, it means a lot to me to have a book talked about in, in, in some depth. I'm so used to, as a writer, getting the, the regurgitation of plot, and that's the end of a, of a review. And plot, plot is the least of my concerns as a writer. It's a concern, but the least. And I want to say thank you to uh, all, all, all three of you, because it's, it's, uh, it's what a writer dreams of, a conversation in some depth. One does not necessarily want applause only. You want some. But mostly you want uh, the feeling that someone's understood in some depth, what it is you you're trying to communicate, and uh, that's a it's a wonderful feeling. It'll make the rest of my night a, a, a lot lighter burden on me. So thank you. 
I want to speak to that. First of all, this is a total buzz for me just to get this out there. This is like a make-believe thing that you would be able to talk about a book with an author present, not only a author, truly. I mean, the San Francisco, what Harold says, it's uh, San Francisco Examiner, the best American writer of his generation, or uh, I, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Now, there's a depth of of greatness where, where comparisons no, are no longer consequential. But that's way the heck up there, and that's where this kind of writing comes. This is this is what we're talking about here. So that I just want to say, this is a buzz for me. Second thing, just to this notion of if if ambiguity and contradictoriness is inextricable in some way from the human condition, and to that extent deconstructs every truth that we propose. In other words, everything we would say as an absolute is also it's the opposite. If that's the case, what other kind of what could be more than that, or what is something that constitutes truth if the truths that we're typically thinking of in this world are always contradictory? And I, well, I'm saying this because in reading that How to Tell a War Story chapter near the end of it, they, what came to my mind is Pilate, Jesus before Pilate, when Pilate asked Jesus, because he's heard all about this person who's done all these wonder-working things, Pilate himself is a Roman educated, which means he's grown up on Greek philosophy. And here he has this, this person a, a kind of a coming out of the sticks, a, a prophet. Mm -hmm. And why not take opportunity in this, you know, ridiculous situation that Pilate has to rule on whether or not this, this uh, bumpkin is going to live or not. Why not just take an opportunity to ask an old high school philosophical question. And so Pilate asked Jesus, what is true? And it's, this is definitely related to the things they carried. The fact that Jesus doesn't respond. When Tim mentioned that he took those flowers and handed them to Linda and didn't say anything, and Linda didn't say anything back. As the novel says, there's a clarity beyond language that was communicated. Any word on top of that would have diminished the intensity of the communication. So that's one sort of reason why you could imagine Jesus not answering, but you could also imagine that the answer was soon to come when Jesus showed on the cross what is the truth. In other words, you've asked me for a generalization, and the truth doesn't speak in generalizations. The truth is something that's going to speak in the body and in images because it's simultaneously a body on a cross, but also in a symbol. And I want to suggest that what Tim had just mentioned about the joy of recognition, if we're imagining what is the truth beyond truth, I'm going to propose, because this novel does, specifically with the imagery, and this is at the end, of seeing through the ice. Okay, this is Tim who sees through the ice into another world where Timmy is. I thought then of the Apostle Paul that we now see as through a glass darkly. Mm -hmm. But someday we will see face to face and we will know as we are known. And I want to propose that it's that knowing as we are known that constitutes a truth beyond all articulable truths that is more satisfying even if your spouse was unfaithful or even if you failed to defend Linda when Nick Vinoff took off his hat, or even if, because of your negligence, Ted Lavender is dead. In other words, all of those things that would constitute sin are somehow redeemed in this moment of recognition that makes this truth of goodness of the quote-unquote real world seem, uh, seem tepid in, in comparison. So I just want to sort of throw that out there because this is a dimension of the book that really started to make me realize that we were moving into the prophetic. Because in this sense, if you're going to get this book, you're going to have an encounter. You're going to you're going to meet something, and it's going to be another, but it's also going to be you. you start, the, the novel says start here, a body without a name. That's a good place to start. And when a, when a right when a, when and a human being looks at death. When a human being sees a nine-year-old is going to die, okay, and then you're this is what you're looking at. Well, what am I going to do about it? Start here, and then you got to transfigure. You got to give that body a name. You got to make that name be the name of all names, but without being a generalization. In other words, you've got to do an incredible kind of magic 
that resurrects as Marianne Bell did. She joined the missing. You've got to do something that joins the missing so that these dismembered people are remembered into a form that no sentence and no legislation on good or bad could even get near in terms of the intensity and intimacy of a union. So I wanna close for my part in saying there are two worlds here. They're on either side of that ice, but in a sense, they are not one you reach after you die. These two worlds interpenetrate in this world. This is a crucial element of this novel. These two world, world, worlds interpenetrate. And one of the, for, for me, my, one of my favorite images in the last way that that blade is described, it is moving on the melt of the ice. Now, first of all, a blade is important in this novel because of its sharpness. Uh, the man at the Tip Top Lodge, Elroy Burdall, he has sharp eyes, and Marianne Bell has sharp eyes. Uh, a sharp instrument can cut into the ice, and you need to cut into the ice. But another element here is that ice is not what the the blade is moving on it's moving on the melt of the ice which means it's moving on the water and when something is moving on the water then that means it's moving on the spirit and it is not leaving the natural world but it is moving in a dimension that the natural world is simply can't move in and to that extent it's re resurrecting even nature so when i say that this novel for me is prophetic it's yes, because there are generalizations that we could say that there's an essence in us, et cetera. But more fundamentally, it's prophetic because it resurrects an encounter with something that can't be generalized about. And that in some ways makes what we think of as the real world more real without leaving it. And I just wanna say that because Tim mentioned that he is, that Toni Morrison is a favorite artist and this is one of the things, Julie, you remember that we talked about in the Song of Solomon, that the world that, that she was creating, one, you didn't have to fly away to fly. You didn't have to leave it to fly. So there is a reclamation of nature. There's a bringing nature. In, in that, that, so sometimes people get the two worlds, but they split them. Uh, this novel, the two worlds interpenetrate. And the last thing I want to say is, if you imagine that as metaphorically possible for the human imagination and the words on this page, then you're getting into something that gets really, really interesting in a way that's both illusory and absolutely real. So thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, everybody, for your company, the company we keep. And I look forward to doing this again. Julie, don't we have one more conversation? We do. Tim, we do. We have one more. Practice. One more conversation. We can one just... more, Tim. One more. Okay. Yeah, we do. Thank you so much. And and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.